That's it. We just want the win for our team. My goodness! as good as men or better it's a huge point for the bay area good chance that's the number one highlight of the week welcome back to major league table tennis my name is ryan willard and i'm going to be totally honest i'm on live tv right now we're on fubo and amazon prime and I don't even know what to say because this weekend here has been insane. This is day three of week 12 at Major League Table Tennis here for the Eastern Division. And over the weekend, we saw the number one team, the Carolina Gold Rush, clinch the number one seed in their division. And then we saw the number two team, the home team here at Ryder University clinch their playoff berth, so we have our two teams who will be going to the playoffs and the championships next month in Chicago. But today, we have even more amazing table tennis action coming to you live from Lawrenceville, New Jersey. So we're gonna start things off, and we're gonna bring our umpires out right now. So first and foremost, please welcome your umpire, Jovana Nazevic, and who will be assisted by Walter Lamb. And of course, your very first team. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Florida Crocs. That's Daniel Gorak, Benjamin Brossier, Matilda Ekholm, Daniel Gonzalez, and Mark Duran. And today, they will be facing the number one seed in the playoffs. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Carolina Gold Rush. That is Enzo Anglais, Romain Laurent, Kai Jong, Jeremy Hazen, Hong Lin, and Bastien Dupont. We have some amazing table tennis coming to you right here, right now. So let's get down with a get down and shake hands, teams. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Lawrenceville, New Jersey, on the campus of Ryder University. Has alumni gymnasium been a wonderful sight this weekend or what for this March weekend of East Division action, Major League Table Tennis? Our Sunday doubleheader commences with Carolina and Florida meeting for the final time during the regular season. The Carolina Gold Rush clinched the top spot in the East Division last night. Princeton Revolution have clinched the two spot, eliminating the Florida Crocs from playoff consideration. So we know who's going to the championship weekend. But we got one more match to play here in the East Division regular season. We're excited to bring it to you, and we welcome you to our broadcast perch. Evan Lepler alongside Matt Hetherington. And Matt, it's been an exhilarating weekend. There were 12 golden points played yesterday across the two matches. We saw the first ultimate golden point of the year, the first one since December. Princeton celebrated, Carolina celebrated. Now it's time for closing statements for Florida and Chicago to see if they can close their season on a nice note. Yeah, yeah, and I think both teams have come into this with the mentality of they're going to fight through to the end. It's kind of echoed in post-match interviews we've had with them. My hope is that we see them kind of loosen up and relax and just get out there and play their best table dance. I think we're going to see some of the best rallies of the season today uh, well, out there on the table. We have seen an interesting lineup change from the Florida Crocs, and we'll show it to you right here for the first time all year. Matilda Ekholm is not playing doubles with Daniel Gorak. Matilda is playing singles alongside uh, against Kai Jong in the third single spot. We'll begin with a matchup we haven't seen since September. Daniel Gorak will take on Roman Lawrence in the first single spot. That's all coming up as we get the action rolling here from Alumni Gymnasium at Ryder University. MLTT, Carolina, and Florida. First serve 
on the other side of this quick break. We are just about set for the start of Sunday action here in Major League Table Tennis. Roman Lawrence for the Carolina Gold Rush, taking on Daniel Gorak for the Florida Crocs. These two players went head to head back in September. They have not played a singles match since, so it's been six months since the last time Gorak and Roman played three games to 11. Gorak took two out of three on that September Saturday six months ago. Korak, the number two pick in the first MLTT draft. He's had a good year, certainly a better first half of the season than the second half. First game to play. Juan Lorenz has been a solid number two player zero, for zero. Carolina all season long, playing in the first single spot here today. And here we go. Final Sunday of the regular season in the East Division. Lorenz to serve first. Reminder about the format, Zero, three games one. to 11 and four separate singles matches and also one doubles match. Each game to 11 is direct to 11, not win by two. Each game worth one point. There are 15 total points up for grabs leading into the golden game, which is two, the culmination zero. of Tough. every team battle. That's worth six points. And yesterday we saw two epic golden games, Matt Hetherington, two all-timers. Yeah, and, and to see the top two teams in the division go all the way down to the wire was pretty unreal, especially here in front of a home crowd. One, three. So Gorak off to an early lead here. Roman typically tries to play a lot of forehand. You can see him stepping around there to play forehand off the backhand corner. Gorak, I mean, he's, he's such a quick player. It's going to potentially cause some problems for Roman. I think, four, you know, if you want to play two. a full table forehand game, the, the last thing you want to play against is someone who plays quick, really quick explosive shots. But what, if any, adjustment would you suggest Roman make here to have the best chance? Um, I think 
a lot of short play. Uh, if he's going to play long, it has to be heavy or really deep on the table. But also to play Five, that cross angle, two. if you can get Gorak out onto the forehand, it kind of cuts off that diagonal angle to the backhand side. Yeah, oh. see, this, this, is, two, this is not what six. Roman wants at all. If he plays cross court, to be able to step around on a ball that's going that wide is really difficult. Two, seven two lead seven. for Gorak. Strong start for the Polish standout who now resides in Clearwater, Florida. Olympian in twenty sixteen in Rio. Seven three. Go. This time, Laurent's targeting four. that forehand diagonal. The wider he can get the ball to break on the table, the more chance it can come back to his forehand. Four, eight. Eight four lead for Gorak. Four, nine. Wow, big step around nine, forehand from five. Roman Laurence. He's been waiting for that. Borak still firmly in control with a couple of serves here to try and wrap game one. Oh, down the line, Nine, winner. Six. Half hearted behind the back effort there, Gorak. <laughs> Strong turnaround here from Seven, Ramon Lorenz. Nine. Wins both points on Gorak's serve. Now he's. Got a chance to tie this thing back up if he can hold serve on his account. Gorak's certainly been no stranger to a comeback effort this weekend. Seven. Net post. Ten. Weekend began, of course, Gorak. Eight of the first nine points against Jishan Liang in the Princeton match. Jishan ran off ten in a row. Ultimately won the match 2-1. Jishan That's did with a golden point in game three. Gorak. A strong seven, overall seven performance games. to start this Sunday for Florida. 11-7 in game number one over the Frenchman, Roman Lorenz. Florida on the board first here in New Jersey.
Match number 22 of the season for the Second Florida Crocs and the Carolina Gold Third. Rush. Gorak picks up where he left off on the opening point of game number two. Placement on oh. that ball. Straight into the body of Daniel Gorak. Now we don't know exactly what the format for MLTT will be in future years. Will there be expansion? Will there be a change of you know, number of games and number of overall matches? How the Golden Game is orchestrated? We don't know. Two, one. But today is the final day for these East Division teams particularly Florida and Chicago, to wrap up what they've done, to put one final bow on their seasons. Certainly Florida has been solid in the Golden Game department, Two. solid in the doubles Two. department. Singles is where the Crocs have ultimately fallen short. Yeah. Began the day, 115 singles game wins, 137 losses. Two. Three. Every other team in the East is at 500 or better. You see Flint Lane, trusty sidekick John Napala. Three, oh. Amongst the fans in the stands here in Lawrenceville. Gold Rush. Had some pleasant weather here in Southern Jersey over the past few days. Sunshine. Comfortable. Um, picking up Four, the aggression three. here in game two. <laughs> Got to take those forehand opportunities when they present themselves. Just doing Five. a great job of targeting that forehand cross court. The diagonal angle on the table is a little bit longer in terms of shot trajectory. So usually when you go cross court, players are much more safe playing the cross court angle back. Three, six. Laurent very much wants to stay on his forehand. So the more he can play that cross court angle, the better. It's the link for the Major League Table Tennis Fantasy League, fantasizer.com. Six, four. Form your own fantasy team of eight players each weekend of competition. Had great fun throughout the season between us commentators. I would like to say friendly competition, but you know, there are some barbs, some barbs around that. Seven, <laughs> four. Friendly barbs. Yeah. Certainly would encourage anyone to get involved with that if you're, especially if you've never done, I'd never done a fantasy league before in any sport. And there's never been Five, more table tennis. So seven. this was like the perfect opportunity for me to get in on it. Will you be filling out a uh, March Madness bracket on no. men's or women's college basketball? No. That could be your next adventure. Uh, I know nothing next adventure. Yeah. That Sometimes knowing nothing is better than knowing everything. The crazy thing is that's 100% true. Six, seven. I think I'll stick to the table tennis fantasy until you wear me down with your statistics <laughs> on, run, on win rates. The irony is, and despite your full season blather, mm. you know, five, five straight weekends in a row, my table tennis fantasy team has outscored you. You, with no knowledge of college basketball, might fill out a better bracket than I would. I stopped filling out brackets about a decade ago for college hoops just because I'm going to watch all the games anyway. And, you know, it would drive me crazy when someone would. Know, root for one of yeah. the top favorites yeah, just because yeah, yeah. they had him going to the final four. 
you got to root for the underdogs. you got to root for the chaos and the drama and the Cinderella stories. Yeah. You know, separate your... But it's, I under, it's hard to separate your own personal, you know, oh, I have $10 on the line. Okay, forget about that 10 bucks and just cherish the moment. Korak back within one. Eight, seven. Drifting half long, just over the edge after one bounce. Laurent's got the cross court angle he wanted for the forehand counter, but just not there with the execution. Nine, here's, a, here's a dumb question. Eight. I don't think I've asked you one yet this weekend, knowingly. This one is knowingly. W w what's why do you say half long instead of long? Um, it's just to distinguish the difference between a ball that really bounces deep on the table and one that just kind of falls over the edge. Um, it's significantly harder to Ten, attack a half eight, long ball. The first yellow card yellow of the card day comes early. The Not even 11.30 and the gold rush are sitting on a yellow. As Lorenz flipped his paddle in frustration after that miss. More, more of a spike than a flip. I must say, he's, he's been having a, quite a bit of frustration out there on the court this weekend. Probably a lot more than we would usually see. Nine yeah, half long. Seven. I mean, we used to practice them and we call them knuckle busters because they, they drop off the table so close to the edge. Um, you have to commit to your shot, but you also have to be extremely careful because, you know, we've seen players hit their thumb on the edge of the table, and when you're swinging hard, it can definitely do some damage. Oh, oh Gorak, he had the oh chance <laughs> to close it out. We got a golden point here. I do have a follow-up question on the half-long vernacular, but we'll get back to it because the weekend of the Golden Point continues here in the Garden State. <laughs> the gift that keeps on giving. Korak serves. Double game point. And Gorak has a 2 0 lead. 10. As the frustration Second. continues to climb for Lawrence. On his serve, Gorak sets the tone. Handles the short return and takes game two by the slimmest of all margins. Daniel Gorak has two points for the Florida Crocs already on the board. Now he'll seek the sweep against Roman Lorenz. Uh, Matt, what stood out to you about the way Daniel played that golden point on his serve? Um, I think primary objective for him is, you know, he served a little bit no spin. Trying to get Roman to pop the ball up if he played short. Um, played out exactly as he wanted, and the first thing he did was drive that ball to the backhand side of Roman. 
Ramon going for the hand switch forehand. Two, zero. Doesn't land it. I don't remember seeing a hand switch forehand all season long, except in my own tennis matches when I try it rather than <laughs> my backhand. I don't, Two, yeah, I don't one. think we've seen one in uh, Major League Table House. Maybe today. We're going to see one go on the table first. One, so one three. One, one quick follow-up on the, the half-long. Do, do you call it half-long because the receiver is genuinely not sure whether the ball will, would bounce a second time yes. on the table? Yeah. Yeah. Two, and three. That's what makes it. It kind of creates a hesitancy among uh, the receiver. Because uh, I mean, if it's not going to hit the table, you have a little bit more time to handle it. Yeah. But this is the second time. Four, There's obviously two. a double bounce. You need to attack it quickly. Yeah, it's a tough ball to attack. It's become a lot more popular in table tennis because, Cross. you know, if somebody serves long and it's actually long, it's much easier to attack with a lot of power. But if the ball's half Four, long, three. It's, you kind of have to handle it a little more delicately and... It's been much more common in players setting up big counter attacks. They kind of try and get the player to open soft and then. Ramon Five, three, looking a little bit two. off here today. Not quite, not quite landing his shots. Switch sides with Borak up 5 3. Carolina choosing not to take a timeout. It is early in the team match. Three, five. We've got some interesting matchups coming up. Azeen and Gonzalez played in November. They have not played since. Azeen swept with Daniel. 3 0. Yeah, style matchup Four, wise, five. that's one that uh, Jeremy will probably like a lot. Um, I don't know if he's actually lost. A match before to Gonzalez. Oh. Best point of the match for Roman Lorenz, without a doubt. Five, Ties five. things up at five five. A lot of movement around the table there, but ultimately. Roman stays on the forehand, drives it home. Five, six. said yesterday when uh, the Princeton Revolution won against Carolina, it's the first time they've ever lost to two teams in one weekend. If the Crocs win this, it will be a blowout for Carolina. I mean, they'll still walk away with the first position in the uh, East Division, but... It's not the ideal way to no. go into the postseason. No, there, there's six weeks in between now and Seven. the championship, so... Those momentum from mid-March carry over to late April. I don't know. They certainly will have a long time to think about this. It's a great point. Come on, looking to Eight. steal away game three here and get a point on the board for Carolina. Gold Rush were utterly dominant in the interdivisional weekend in Rock Hill. So that should give them some confidence going into the West uh, against the West team's championship, however. Obviously, the West teams were not at their Six, best nine. in that weekend. And certainly, some questions that still need to be answered. Roman Lorenz. After trailing 5-3, has won seven, seven of the last six. eight points here to set up a game point to salvage a 
single point for the Gold Rush in this opening singles match. How about that? Gorak stayed alive <laughs> with the backhand block and spin. Takes a bite out of his paddle in defeat. But Gorak still victorious overall. He wins two of the three games, but look, that's an important point for Carolina and particularly for Roman Lorenz. He's had a tough weekend overall, but a uh, strong closing statement for Roman as he takes game three, 11-6. Daniel Gorak wins two out of three games over Roman Lorenz to start this Sunday competition. Daniel joins us now. Daniel, congratulations. A strong performance for you. What were you most pleased about for the way you uh, battled Roman today? Good morning, guys. Uh, I know uh, Roman for the long time. Uh, we play one time in the Major League. Uh, and I know how I'm supposed to play. I'm doing my tactic all the time. And it works for two sets. And... In the end, I miss maybe it's too much, and <laughs> he won the last game. And how was your team's preparation this morning? I mean, obviously you're coming into this match um, without a chance of making the playoffs now. Um, I know both teams, every team still wants to win, obviously. Um, how does does your focus shift at all? Do you feel a little bit more relaxed, or is this still all guns blazing? I try to be relaxed all this weekend, but uh, if you feel the pressure, then of course it's very difficult. Uh, today we have nothing to win instead of maybe some money and uh, good results. For sure we fight for each point and I trying my best, uh, but just maybe today I look a little bit more calm, but also I'm a little bit tired. Daniel, on that last point, we saw a little spin move after uh, one of your shots. It did, ended up not working out, but uh, that's something you've been working on, that spin move from the backcourt? <laughs> the 360 lob. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I didn't play so many so many <laughs> balls like that, and he surprised me, he surprised me to receive this ball, and he won the nice shot. Daniel, thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll see you in doubles just here in a little bit. Thank you, thank you. Hazin versus Gonzalez for the second time this season. And Gonzalez takes the opening point. Hazin defeated Daniel 3-zip back in November. 11-7, 11-8, and 11-10. So all three games were reasonably tight. And Gonzalez off to a blazing start Zero. here. Two. Yeah, stylistically an interesting match. Gonzalez is a pretty aggressive player. Jeremy has in more, much more Two. steady and controlled. One. Less of a power player. But excellent placement. Two. Two. See these players competing in the US quite a bit. Gonzalez from Puerto Rico. Jeremy from Canada. season where every single point's been won by the server. Maybe this is that game. Darn. Oh, maybe Three. not. <laughs> Three. 
is almost poetic. <laughs> So close. And Jeremy Hazeen takes the lead for the first three. time. One of the big factors in this match is obviously for Gonzalez to keep up his aggressive game and maintain power. He needs balance. He needs good positioning and balance. And Jeremy just so solid on the backhand defense and the counters, but Three, he just moves five. the ball around. He has very good awareness of where his opponent is on the table. <laughs> Gonzalez misses the cross-court forehand counter. 6-3 for Jeremy Hazin. Jeremy's a pretty animated character on the table. Yeah, he wears <laughs> his emotions on his sleeve every single time he's competing. <laughs> Just spent Seven, a month, four. almost a month in Saarbrücken in Germany, one of the top Bundesliga clubs, practicing to prepare for the Canadian Olympic trials. Five. Seven. Helped him take two out of three games over Tim Wong here on Friday. Azim was inactive yesterday, but back in the Gold Rush lineup this morning. Six, Dallas is seven. Far his way back within one. by Gonzalez. Seven, eight. Cross court, right on the line. And the Florida Crocs are back in front in this opening game. Time out, second Gold singles, Rush. and Carolina is going to hit the pause button. Alex Yang is going to have a chat with Jeremy Hazine. Time out for the Gold Rush. Recognize any of the vocabulary there, Matt? No, it's a Sunday morning, Evan. I <laughs> it's tough for me on a regular day. Seven, eight, gold rush. Alex and Jeremy, Coach Alex Yang and Jeremy. Have a oh, he missed oh, it. He missed it. They've, they've Nine, built a, a pretty seven. good coach and player relationship beyond MLTT, but also long before it. I know Jeremy's been visiting Alex Yang's Atlanta, Georgia club for many years on and off over the last decade. Coach Yang actually seven, went for the last seven. week that Jeremy was in Germany to help him prepare as well, so. Game points for Gonzalez. This is the opportunity. Seven. And it looked like he stopped at the end of that shot. Oh, 
Azeen again fights off another Nine, game point. Ten. Timeout, Crocs. And now wow. Frank Arias going to take a timeout. Two timeouts for the, the within the span of four points. Yeah. I just barely knew right now. This is insane. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Subacan no es tan peligroso, pero él la pone. Ahí él te la, te la levantó ahorita. Ok, se, 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 girate un poco la muñeca antes, pero tranquilo. Bacan igual, seguirle con, con tu vaca en paralelo hasta que tú tienes la oportunidad de virarte y atacarlo. Y atacarlo yo creo que al medio. Ready to end this game right now? Yeah. Oh, on here. Borak said it simply in a language that we all understand. Nine, ten. Two more chances. You need just one. You're, you're in the driver's seat. Yeah. Yikes. Ten. Oh. Ten. Definitely not the serve receive he wants. Does have the serve in hand. For the golden point. That's right, make the noise. Gonzalez serving at 10 all. Oh, goodness. He caught the edge. Gonzalez apologizes, but also claims game one with that strong effort on golden point. Some big swing from Daniel Gonzalez. And the Puerto Rican takes the opening game against the Canadian Jeremy Hazin. Florida Crocs officially eliminated from playoff contention yesterday. Second game. When the Gold Princeton Rush Revolution serve. won zero, their golden zero. game 21 to 20 against Carolina. Angela Guan over Hong Lin in the final ultimate golden point. And a strong start for the Crocs on this Sunday morning. Three out of the first four points, including One, a couple of golden zero. points going the way of the DG. Daniel Gorak and Daniel Gonzalez. <laughs> Let's see Jeremy Zero, two. going back to what he does best, working the angles. Lots of wide angles. Loves to block the ball corner to corner. Try and get his opponent off balance. One, Gonzalez has done two. a pretty good job of handling it so far. These are physically tough rallies to be involved in. Three, one. Stuff from Jeremy Hazine to start game two. Four, one. Gonzalez set up that ball so well. He got the counter attack in, but you've got to be really careful when you're playing Jeremy Hazine. When you play with power, not to hit at his racket. This is so steady. Two, four. 
the players that have had the best success for him have really tried to play angles that break the table off the left and right side. If he played within the confines of the table, kind of down the center, Jeremy can just, just hold the table, stays very close. That's a good example of that right there. Two, Jeremy reacting five. like he lost the point, but he won it. Like I said, he's a very animated character. <laughs> you won the point, Jeremy. Come on now. Six, two. Opening loop clips the net. Six, two for the Canadian. Six, three. You could get a, a pretty good reel of Jeremy Hazine's slow mo facial expressions from the season. Seven. Be a pretty good game. Show the facial expression and ask, did Jeremy win the point or did Jeremy lose the point? Yeah. And finally, Gonzalez hit around Four, the wall. Seven. is doing a pretty good impersonation of the wall. Finally, Gonzalez finds the angle. Jeremy can only smile at that one. Seven, five. Zala's on a bit of a run here. counter opportunity. Eight, five. You can see Gonzalez is really pressuring Jeremy's first opening shot to try and get a softer loop. Giving himself a lot of opportunities to counter attack. Five, nine. Six, nine. Jeremy just, just talking himself through the motions. <laughs> what a forehand counter Nine, from seven. Gonzalez. Long serve over the forehand edge. It's a great serve set up to use against a left handed player. Just breaks the corner of the table. Fun point there. Nine, Gonzalez eight. catches a break. The net ball stayed in, and it's a one point game. again from Gonzalez, nine, just nine. stepping it up here at the end of the second game. The reality is neither player has a timeout to use the rest of this match. They only take the one timeout per the match. So each coach using a timeout in game one. It's up to these players right now to try to get to the finish line on their own. Nine all, Gonzalez serving. Big chole from Nine, Hazin. Seven. It's a huge point to the gold rush. Gonzalez really went for broke on that one. Lost his balance a little bit. Oh. 
and a service error. 11 9, ends the second game. Ends the Both game, right. I should say. Prevents us from another golden point. Hazin evens up this singles match, one game apiece. And they'll play one more to 11 to determine the winner. For the season now, Jeremy Hazine and Daniel Gonzalez Third have played game, five different to serve, games zero, zero. across two matches. Hazine has won four of the five games, but all five games have been close. Wow. Zero, one. Jeremy just as patient as ever. He gets that early forehand counter and it's quite a lot of pace on it. Usually the earlier in the bounce you hit the ball, the more acceleration you can get. It takes One. the time away from One. your opponent. I tell you, time's a precious commodity in this sport. What's the best... Uh measurement scale for time in table tennis? Uh, usually yeah. of seconds? Yeah, the, the, usually one. the reaction time is one-tenth of a second. Um, and that's across a nine-foot surface. So it's uh, kind of the, the sport that personifies oh. blink and you'll miss it. <laughs> one, three. I love some of our slow mo replays because yeah. you just Let's. You know, uh, appreciate it in a different way. The level of hand eye coordination, the angle with which players Two, adjust their three. wrist, adjust their paddle, the footwork. And Mark Duran. Duran. What, uh, what's your first impressions when you see that uh, pair on paper? Uh, I'm going to be really interested to see how Mark Duran plays in the doubles because I know Five, he's two. been quite successful with doubles in Spain, um, Spanish national champions, stuff like that. But in singles, we see him back off the table so much right. and <laughs> play all kinds of interesting shots so can't really do that Five, the two, same way. Goal no, you back off the table and you're kind of shooting your partner in the foot more than anything so yeah it will definitely be interesting i mean enzo and hong are such a great pair it'll be interesting to see how they as a mixed doubles pairing go against a men's doubles duo Two lead for Jeremy Hazin. 
Goes for the Three. wide angle and Three. misses. There have been uh, nine team matches this year where there's been a men's doubles team versus a mixed doubles team. That's 27 total games that have been played, men's doubles versus mixed. Six, four. Men's doubles have won 11, mixed doubles have won 16. I imagine uh, Cole and Rachel Sung are probably <laughs> a, t a factor in that. Seven, four. Frustration boiling over there for Gonzalez. Hazin closing in. Five, seven. Gonzalez is very much in striking range here in the third. Just two points behind. It was a big point right there that he just won. Yeah, it was good when you have that moment of frustration to come back and win the next point. It helps you settle back in. What a point from Gonzalez. Six, seven. Plays that backhand down the line. You can see Jeremy was stepping across again. Good. Seven all. Seven all. Spoke too soon when I said Hazim was closing in, up seven four. Gonzalez takes the Seven, lead. Eight. Oh, he had the opportunity for eight, it. Eight. Eight. Bit of a fade on the serve return. with the serve. You could see just Nine, the small eight. changes in placement from Gonzalez. Three forehands in a row, just moving closer and closer to the middle. Jeremy had to try and adjust his backhand positioning. That is an excellently constructed point there from Gonzalez. Nine, Jeremy comes nine. back with a big serve return. Yeah, that's a huge point there. Hazim with two serves coming up at nine all. Nine, nine. 10 in game one, 11, nine in game two. It'll be one of those scores in game three. Two or three points left in this match. A little cat and mouse there. Ten, nine. Zine gets the game point first. the opportunity for a golden point. Crocs are 2-0 and on golden points so far today. One of them earlier in this match. Crocs also won a golden point against Lawrence. Gonzalez serves. And Gonzalez air mails it long. So Hazin escapes with two out of three for the gold rush and evens up the team tally.
three points apiece through two singles matches. And it's a win for the Canadian lefty, Jeremy Hazine. Ladies and gentlemen, arriving at the court and warming up right now, in the green, representing your Florida crop, your five-time Polish national champion, he is once ranked 52 in the world. Please welcome Daniel. We are back at Ryder University, the Florida Crocs and the Carolina Gold Rush. Jeremy Hazine just won a golden point to take two out of three. Uh, Jeremy, I mean, this you could call it a dead rubber, but certainly the passion and energy on the table with you and Daniel felt like there was a lot on the line. Uh, first time you played him in a while, three really close games. What in your mind was the story of that match? So actually, this match, of course, uh, he, my opponent played a really good match. And I wasn't expecting a lot of the stuff that he did because last time uh, he played completely different and his strategy was also completely different. But I think this time he really changed and I don't think I was ready for it. Um, actually, I don't know why, but really this match I couldn't really keep my focus because actually every single set, regardless of who won the set, if you look at every single set, even starting from the first set, I always was leading by a margin of at least three, four. So I think when I was leading, I think I took it too much for granted and I started playing passive. But okay, he's a good player, so if you're gonna play passive, you cannot expect to uh, win at this level. You have to earn every point. And I mean, you've obviously had a lot of good results against him before in the past. I don't know if you, have you, you've probably won every time, right, I think? No, I've lost to him before. before. But okay, of course I won like more than I lost, but yeah. he actually beat me like I think two times uh, in total. But I think that it doesn't matter what happens in the past. So every match is a new journey. Regardless of the result in the past, every match is a new adventure. So well, we got a new doubles match coming up. Jeremy, thanks for uh, joining us. We'll see you in the Golden Game. Men's doubles for Florida, mixed doubles for Carolina. The first time all season One, the Crocs zero. have tweaked their lineup and taken Ekholm out of the doubles spot, giving her a chance to play singles today. We'll see her in singles against Kai Jong coming up. One, all. But uh, certainly a, a lot to think about. You mentioned the stylistic choices Duran has made playing singles. Mm. That's a Two, good reach one. over the table smash. I have a feeling we're going to see a very different Duran playing this match. How does this change for Gorak and his mentality? Um, well, obviously he's playing with a right-hander instead of left. Um, so there are some positioning and footwork changes that have to happen um, compared to playing with Matilda. But I think Duran will probably be a lot more aggressive. Obviously, Ekholm tends to open slower and spinnier. Duran's got pretty pretty compact and sharp strokes. So. Let's. Yeah, I mean, anytime you change doubles combinations, you, you lose some advantages, pick up others. Let's. Hong and Enzo have both the left and right-handed combination also. Hong being penhold and short pips is stylistic. Oh. Some interesting shots thrown into the mix there in that point. Yes, indeed. Duran with the no look. <laughs> well, I 
Yes, we will still see some Mark Duran flare from him. That was returned by Enzo with a 360. Wow. Enzo looking as sharp as ever. Just catches the back edge. Three, five. I see Hong Lin back out here today. She certainly took the Golden Game loss against Princeton yesterday quite heavily. I know I spoke to a bunch Four, of the players five. after the match, and they said the, the main reason that she was so upset was because she felt like the, the team had really pulled everything together and being able to fight back like that she was in a position to close it out for them and I think a lot of expectation riding on her especially given her previous results against Angela in Golden Game. Swing and a miss from Duran and the gold rush back in front here in the opening game of the doubles. Just doing a great job of setting the ball up for Enzo's attack. Very consistent. Steady forehand flex, great placement. Seven, five. Enzo having a chat with Gorak across the table. Too good from Carolina. Nice. Tricky serve nine. there from Duran. Game points now for the Carolina pair. Mixed doubles combinations continuing to prevail here in MLTT. And they take game one, 11-6. So and Hong Lin have been the best doubles team in the league all year long. Carolina now 51 and 13 in doubles games for the season. Carolina takes its first lead of the day. For the first time today, that uh, overall one-loss record 
projecting zero, zero. A Carolina victory in the 22nd and final match of the season for the playoffs that are coming six weeks from One, now in zero. Chicago. Matt, how would you assess the, the movement and teamwork of Duran and Gorak playing doubles together zero, for the two. first time through you know, 20 points or so? Um, I think it's okay. Yeah. Obviously not not on the level required to to win the first game. Um, it would be really tough. Oh. One, you know, two. knowing how to set your partner up and knowing how to move around them well or what shots they like. It, it takes a lot of repetitions to, to really figure out Three, your partner and, and to form a, a good doubles team. So, you know, you can have two really exceptional players. You can have two players who are really good at doubles. Um, but when they play together for the first time, it can still be really tough. So we'll see. Four, I mean, good one. start in game two so far. So they've obviously had some discussions to try and recalibrate here. So remember we have the order change when the players switch ends. They'll play to the opposite player they did in the last game. So this time Mark Duran playing to Hong. Three, four. Let's see Chicago and Princeton have arrived in the back corner. Duran's in there. This time, Gorak just sweeping the ball up. 7 3, three lead seven. now for Duran and Gorak here in game two. play doubles along with Koyo Kanemitsu. Oh! Sure they had a great celebration yesterday evening. Eight, four. Having secured their playoff position for championship weekend. I think last night's match was by far Princeton's best performance so far in this season. Pretty electric stuff. Eight, five. Hong Lin catches Daniel Gorak off guard there. And here Enzo saying, we are there. If they get this point, they'll have two serves. They could be right there. I think there's just something different about this combination of players on the table and doubles that you know, as, as you look at the corner and see members of both Princeton and Chicago looking on, there's intrigue as to, mm. you know, this is something they haven't seen before. Six, eight, let's play. Players on Princeton and Chicago have obviously competed against all these players, but not in these combinations. Enzo goes for a big backhand. Nine. 
in, sails it wide. So a slew of game points here for the Crocs. Even up this doubles match at one game apiece. Not yet. Ten, seven. That's what we want. That's what Enzo has just said to Hong. Can oh. another solid forehand flick Eight, there from seven. Hong Lin. Frenzo and Hong before even going over to the towels. <laughs> they claw their way back to within one point deficit. Good stuff from Hong Lin and Enzo. Certainly the more experienced pair playing together after this long season collaborating. It was 10 6, now it's 10 9. Oh! Enzo sends it hard into the net, and Florida. Survives and takes game two by two. So the team tally is 4-4. This doubles match is tied at a game apiece. The lead going into the intriguing Ekholm John singles matchup will be decided by this next game to 11. Alrighty, game three. Enzo Anglais and Hong Lin for Carolina. Daniel zero, Gorak zero. and Mark Duran for Florida. 22 matches. This is the 21st time Enzo and Hong are playing together. In doubles. 22 matches for Florida. This is the first time that Gorak and Duran are playing together. Oh, that ball just rode the net at the end there. One, zero. And so having no problem dealing with that I mean, it's, it's wild fun. backhand slice. It's fun to watch Gorak and Duran scramble, but it doesn't feel like that's their best method to success. Yeah, not really. I think and, and a lot of the reason that I think uh, Hong and Enzo had such a strong start in the first game is because Enzo's not really too phased by all of the variations that Duran can throw at him, whereas I think Hong was a little bit thrown off by it. Zero, three. So it'll be important for them to get a strong start in the first half. Players will change ends at five, and the order will change again. Oh. Hong's forehand flick game has been solid throughout this doubles. It's a winner against the serve of Gorak there. And they'll 
get the exact start that they wanted. 5-0 as the players cross sides of the table. The order switches. We have a mixed doubles on one side here. We're about to have a mixed singles in game number three between Matilda Ekholm and Kai Jung. One-way traffic right now here in game three. We, we have seen several firsts this weekend. You mentioned Carolina losing twice in a single weekend for the first time. We also saw Enzo Hong lose a doubles match for the first time against Jishan and Angela here yesterday. Do you think there's something... Uh, with Jishan and Angela that will I mean, some spark that of uh, chemistry camaraderie that will continue for them do they figure something out in doubles this weekend uh, I mean they must have figured out something because they played much better than we've seen them together throughout the season um, I think yeah a lot of it's just figuring out how to set up Jishan's attack distances from the table so I think small details Oh, that is a wide angle. And so ends up on the floor. Trying to go after that one. One. So up 8-0 and still <laughs> diving for a ball. First point on, on the board. On a dead rubber. Oh. How about that from Hong Lin just whipping it down the line. seen too many games this lopsided all weekend long. Two, nine. It's really been a, a splendid weekend competition. All four teams really going hard. But, uh, Ten, this two. third game in the doubles, one point away from being a convincing Carolina victory. And there it is. So Borak and Durant win game two, 11-9. But it's a nine-point win in game three for Enzo Anglis and Hong Lin. Carolina has a 5-4 lead as we get excited for this mixed singles match that's on deck. Enzo Anglais and Hong Lin victorious in a doubles match for the 20th time this season. Enzo, you have uh, gone 21 and 1 in doubles matches this year. Uh, congratulations. What was different about playing Mark and Daniel as opposed to Matilda and Daniel? Uh, I want to say nothing special because we won, I think, all against uh, Matilda and, uh, and Daniel. But the only tricky part is that because there is two um, men in, in front of us that only want to play stronger or harder and then make mistakes. So that's, uh, I told her before, it's not because there is two men who is a quite good level in front that we need to play stronger than usually, right? So, so she didn't and uh, she put the ball on the table. We were very aggressive. We were really playing together from 0-0. Zero, zero. And uh, I don't know why, but this double for me was very important because 
to keep the dynamic also before the playoff and everything. Uh, all the games are very important. But uh, I think she suffered a little bit from yesterday, last point, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it was good to just come back with a win like this and against two players that wanted potentially to give her a lot of struggle with high balls, backspin balls, yeah. side spin balls, and they didn't succeed doing that. So S since you brought happy. up yesterday, what was your message to Hong Lin after the final point yesterday? It's sport, you know. Um, at the beginning of the season, Angela lost uh, eight out of eight in the Golden Game, and um, and Onglin saved us three, four times in the Golden Game. So you know, this is sport, and we win, we lose. We fought until the end. Yeah, 2020, it's her, but it could be me too, you know. So <laughs> it's not her responsibility; it's our. All right, Enzo. We'll see you in the set. singles. Thank you. For the first time this year in a singles match, Matilda Ekholm versus Kai Jung. And Matilda One, takes the zero. opening point, aided by the net. Yeah, I mean, this, this could be an interesting match. I mean, Matilda, she's played some outstanding Golden Game points against some of the male players in the league. And zero. we saw Jung Kai kind of struggle a lot throughout the weekend to find the right rhythm. I mean, okay, Koyo played outstandingly against him yesterday. It was a very tough match for him. One, but two. The strength here for Matilda is that her first openings are quite hard for male players to counter because they drop they drop low quite quickly. Two, two. But hopefully we see some great play here from Matilda. She's a fantastic server. See a lot of direction Three, changes, two. hook shots, inside outs. She did say post-match after the doubles yesterday. She's not the fastest player in the league, but she likes two, to think she four. might be one of the smarter and uh, more strategic players. She said table tennis has been her life since as long as she can remember. At the time, winning the national championship in singles in Sweden. Also won several doubles championships, too. I must say Three, that, four. you know, obviously, I met Matilda after I came to the U.S., but um, Matilda's Olympic story is one of the four, most, four. <laughs> to a degree, heartbreaking, but also inspiring stories. I right. mean, she qualified for maybe two or even three Olympics. I think two Olympics yeah. for 08, Sweden. 12. Yeah, wasn't, uh, wasn't granted the, the right to play by the Swedish Olympic Five, Committee four. and just kept going and finally got to compete in 16 in Rio. Yeah, and the crazy thing in 12, I think she won the World Olympic oh. qualification, which is not Five, an easy Five. tournament to win. Still didn't get the chance to play. Grew up in a small village called Vikingstad in Sweden. It's a pretty cool name for a town. Played table tennis and soccer growing up. She said she was Six, better at table five. tennis, so she focused on table tennis. Kai Jong has the lead for the first time here. by Matilda Ekholm. What do you think's percolating in Kai Jong's mind right Six. now, Matt? It's gonna be a little bit of pressure. I mean, there's usually, Six, you know, when seven. men's players come up against women's players, there's that the pressure comes from the fact that the women's players are quicker. They play closer to the table. They play shorter, sharper shots. You know, a lot of uh, a lot of top spin driving, seven, so the pace seven. is difficult to deal with. But with Matilda, it's it's slower. It's a slower pace. Lots of wide angle breaks and a lot of pressure receiving serve against her as well. Her reverse pendulums are really well developed <laughs> serve. That's Eight, a shot seven. that just. Kai Jung, if he's connecting, can be successful for him all the time. But 
Yeah, at the same time, I mean, Kai's, Kai should feel really confident. I mean, <laughs> Seven, he's nine. won so many tournaments on the East Coast throughout his career against the best players in the country. This is just the 13th time in over 80 MLTT matches that we've seen a mixed singles showcase. Seven, ten. That reverse pendulum serve wins the point out right for Ekholm. Game points for Kai Jong on his serve. Carolina takes game one. 11, eight. Guide the ball down the line there. Lead umpire took a yellow card. She didn't present it though. See it until it gets the yellow for that little paddle flip at the end. Like they have given a yellow card. I'm not sure if they did give a yellow card to. Second game. Total, there is Gold one sitting serve, on the, uh, zero, zero. the scorecard of the assistant umpire Walter Lamb on the side of Matilda. One, zero. Any major adjustments that either player needs to make in game two? I think Kai just needs to play with more control. Yeah. Yeah. Right, that catch. Did, edge. Did, did clip the edge of the table. Oh. Zero, two. <laughs> Matilda just had a facial expression that said, I'm not so sure, but I'm not going to win any argument now. Yeah, I think the... The, the major adjustment is, is to control. I mean, yeah, Kai Zero plays three. really explosive attacking game, but he needs to pick and choose when to play soft. Like I said, a lot of the men's players in the doubles as well have struggled with Matilda's slow topspin play Four to counter, zero. especially Jishan when we've seen those doubles combos pair up against each other. So you, you have to choose when it's smarter to block the ball. Let's. All right, good timing Five, there, good zero. connection from Kai Jung. Table, not Zero, a great start two. for Aircom. Yeah. The most successful female player in these mixed singles matches has been Jong, not Kai Jong, but Lily really? Jong, of yeah. course. Yeah. Oh, she's had some outstanding matches playing for the Bay Area Blasters. Remember the Pleasanton weekend? Winning against Rebite and one. McDonald. And singles. So 
So you can see, I mean, we talked really early in this uh, team match about half long. You can see Kai serving half long. He gets a softer opening from Ekholm that he can counter attack. Three, seven. That's one of the tricky things about serving half long is where the first bounce goes as well. Wow. Three, eight. Got to be careful. The, the strength of her first opening is that it stays low and kind of dips. She doesn't want to kick the ball up too much, especially against a player with a forehand Nine, like three. Chang Kai. Zhang's forehand just disappears when he when he drills it. Let it's by you so quick. Quick release Let too. He doesn't wind up like some other players. He's not yeah. like Jishan or Enzo. Yeah. It's like a just a powerful flick and man he crushes it. Yeah, there's the Ten, three. smart decision from Zhang to just get on top of the ball and block. Don't let the ball drop below the table. Eleven two three, second goes game. to John. Eleven Go three. Much more comfortable margin in game two for the Carolina player. And the Gold Rush now leads seven to four on the team tally. Jong has a chance to guarantee Carolina a lead heading into the Golden Game if he can complete the sweep. So Carolina third has game. now earned Crops seven of the first zero, 11 zero. points in this Sunday morning affair. Matilda Ekholm trying to salvage a single game One, here in this zero. singles match. Kai Jung, 11-8 and 11-3, victorious in the first couple. Shots like that, One, just old. taking control of the match. She's based in the New York area. Two, National coaching one. director for Ping Pod. She's very familiar with Kai. She's probably well aware this would be a very tough match coming into it. Oh. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Two, what a great point. Mixed in the chop. And then the block down the line to take that big point over Kai Jong. She's got to be happy with that. <laughs> oh, Jong apologetic. That's as perfect of a nip ball winner as you can have in terms of just ending the point quick. I suppose you Four, could institute two. a rule. You know, if, if, if that was the serve that landed that way with a couple quick bounces, it would be a let. Sh should there be a return let? Should no. you have to return it onto the table without connecting with the net? They actually thought about doing away with the serve let rule. Um, I'm sure. It was trialed in the German league probably six or seven years ago now. Four, three. That, yeah, let serves wouldn't be a thing. But uh, that idea died away pretty quickly. <laughs> it's, uh, I've watched a, a little bit of college tennis mm -hmm. over the past 
couple years, and there are no lets in college tennis. Wow. I didn't know. They four, play four. every single let in college tennis because I think at one point, you know, they don't have the technology to. So it was just too many arguments. Was it a let? Was it right. not a let? So just play all lets. Yeah, I know. I know. Four, in uh, five, in ball, it was also a thing, and at least, well, recreationally, play all lets in pickleball. Yep. Do you think it would be a, a good trial to you know, if MLTT decided we're gonna we're gonna play all lets or no? I think there's a. Uh, because the ball is so small in table tennis, um, and it can drop so close to the net. I mean, Six a tennis four. net and a pickleball net have significantly more height. Sure. Um, a table tennis net, Six sometimes, inches. yeah, sometimes the ball can hit it and just drop, and it's impossible to retrieve. Seven, four. Yeah, Com still keeping herself pumped up out there. She wants to play her best table tennis. she produced some pretty stunning rallies oh. here and there. Eight, four. Tough ass to compete with a forehand like that, though. There's nothing you can do about that. Boom. And this ball just disappears off his paddle. Pretty good backhand from Ekholm. Five, eight. Oh, are you kidding me? Can you believe that? Nine. Five. It did not look like it was going to catch the whole way, and it just kept coming back to the table and then grazed it on the way down. I really can't believe that went on. We'll show that to you again. Ten, five. The long rally. I want to show you the live action, of course, too, but maybe going to break. I mean, Kai Jong did not need the help of the table tennis gods necessarily. <laughs> yeah, Ekholm goes for the round the net. 11-5 in game three. Kai Jong completes the sweep over Matilda Ekholm. And the Carolina Gold Rush have guaranteed themselves a lead heading into the Golden Game. Still have Enzo versus Brossier. Two Frenchmen set to battle. Welcome back to Ryder University, where Kai Jung just swept Matilda Ekholm three straight games. Kai, the first ever meeting against Matilda in a singles match in MLTT. What was the mindset going into it? How did you feel about your performance? Um, I'm pretty happy that I could win 3-0 at the end, but uh, before the match, uh, to be honest, I was pretty nervous, you know, because <laughs> I, I mean, I, I mean, she has a very good serve, and also her timing is a little bit different than mine, and. Um, I play her, I think, in Miami, like the uh, Golden Game. You know, I lost actually like three points and win one point. So that match, I actually, I took uh, pretty seriously. Yeah. And what what kind of adjustments did you have to make? Make. I mean, obviously, you you play. You talked about her timing. Um, we've seen a lot of the male players in the league struggle in the doubles because 
her first loop kind of depths a little bit. Yeah. Um, how do you change your game to, to make sure that you can get those counters in? I mean, I saw you kind of slow down and block some a little bit, but you also managed to get her to kind of kick the ball up more so the bounce was higher. Yeah, so basically uh, when I serve, I try to just serve more uh, top spin and sometimes like half long, sometimes short because yeah. I know she got trouble with that one. And she can't really make a lot of spin on that top spin serve. So I think on my serve, like I don't have so much problem, but like on the receive, I try to keep my eyes open, you know, and uh, watch closely because she's like uh, changing a lot, like by hand, forehand, yeah. under spin, top spin. So I try to like push longer so I can um, avoid, you know, like the like the spin basically. And then I try not to counter loop every ball. <laughs> I try yeah, to like yeah. block. <laughs> yeah. Interesting perspective. Appreciate you sharing. Congrats on the 3 0 sweep. We'll see you in the Golden Game, yeah, Kai. Thank you. Nice to hear a, a player addition to our conversation about half long, <laughs> half long serves. Yes, indeed. For the first time this year in a singles match. Enzo Angles versus Benji Brossier. Enzo's the top player in the league, so he's obviously considered a favorite. What uh, what do you view as Brossier's chances here? What does he got to do to stay in it against Enzo? I think serve returns really one of the important factors against Enzo. I mean, you need to stop Enzo really early in a point. If I think one of... Enzo's biggest skills is how he com compounds into a point. He makes the first opening attack, and then he just builds on it. So for Brossier, it's about Zero pressuring three. the first opening into the rally, trying to take the initiative himself. Usually, if, if Enzo makes the first attack, you've, you've really got to stay on top of it. And Brossier does. Three, one. Hey. Kind of similar to Mark Duran, we often see Brossier backing away from the table. Is that a problem against Enzo? Uh, I think it. <laughs> I think it would be. Um, Enzo, he plays a lot of sharp angles, especially yeah. wide to the forehand yeah. against right-handers. So, Three, you know, if you end up really far back from the table, the angles only get more difficult to deal with. So, you know. If you're at the back barrier, that wide forehand angle is going to cut into the corner of the court. <laughs> Two, four. But also, like I said, you know, if, if Enzo makes the first attack, you've got to put pressure on it. It's really difficult to pressure someone when you're backed off the table. You know, if you really want to keep good pressure on them, you have to be close. Brossier will need to win at least one game here to keep the Crocs hopes alive going into the Golden Game. If the Carolina Gold Rush get a sweep Six, here, it'll be 11-4. It'll be guaranteed oh. the majority of the points on offer here. Having said that, at this stage, the points, <laughs> the points count less now than they have earlier in the season. Enzo Angles letting it rip. Seven, two. Yeah, you can see Brossier backed halfway up the court, just not able to apply enough pressure. Wow. That combination of shots from Enzo. Two, eight. Such a quick change of direction. Too good. Two, nine. It's the battle of the short ball. Rossier finally sends it long, and Enzo's ready for it. Nine, three. 
Garcia right. duels him in that rally. Garcia, when he can get him with the forehand, really solid in the counter look rally. Especially on that cross court angle. So trying to block his way through that point. Garcia keeps up the offensive. Still trails by four here in game one. Big fist pump from Anglais as he sets up game point. And that'll do it for game one. 11-5, first game. Enzo Anglais took two out of three points in the doubles. He's played in the first single spot more often than the fourth single spot this year. But uh, no difference in his level of focus and precision. 11-5 for Anglais in the opening game. Second game. Wichita, 12, three zero, weeks. And zero, zero. Six weeks from now, championship weekend in Chicago. Game two between Brossier and Anglis underway. And Brossier takes the 1 0 lead. 1 0. Oh. Had a great, uh, great audience last time we were in Chicago. So. Look forward to seeing who shows up for the finals. Certainly if uh, some of the matches throughout the season have been anything to indicate, I mean the Portland crowd, even Pleasanton, and the fans showed up for Lily Jung and here in Lawrenceville, New Jersey for the Princeton Revolution team, we've had some pretty electric audiences. One, two. Enzo thought that ball was cracked, and it sounds like he was correct. Get another ball from Walter Lamb. Classe backing off the table pretty quickly there. What do you think about the, uh, the rule change for championship weekend? to make the golden game matter in every single game, no matter what. You see Anglais go around the table. Go see him go down the what? middle. What? Oh, oh what a point. Fighting his tail off, but Enzo with just too much quality. He said Crossier didn't do a good enough job of returning that round the net to start the point. Look at that backhand counter. Major League Table Tennis deciding to shift the rules in that the Golden Game is not necessarily worth six 
like it is during the regular season. The Golden Game is worth everything at championship weekend. But unlike the regular season where you can only have a maximum five point lead going into the Golden Game, now you could have a lead as many as 15, theoretically, if you won 15 nothing. So, did you, did you like that change? Yeah, I think it makes sense. Um, I think a lot of consideration went into how they were going to approach this. Obviously, you know, when you get to a, another fantastic rally here from both players. Enzo backed off the table. Oh! Rossier takes it. Yeah, Four, think, three. You know, obviously we've had a kind of round robin format that's based on points. You get to a bracket and the points are not as important. It's about who wins and who loses. Let's and play. Removing that cap from the golden game definitely makes sense. Brassier, big five, forehand three. counter. He's 5-3 in the lead here in the second game. What's changed here in game two for Brassier? Brassier is looking more aggressive. There's a little bit more punch in his shots. We've seen even on the occasions where he's been backed off the table, he's tried to reclaim that ground by moving back in. Wow. He's putting the pressure on Six, Enzo. Three. Frustration brewing now for Anglis in a way that we don't see very often. Obviously, he holds himself to a very high standard. We've seen him win matches and be disappointed with his level. Missed that one too. Three, seven. And Brossier's got a 7 3 lead here. Pretty hesitant on that serve return. Yes, indeed. That's Four, half seven. long magic if I ever saw it. And there's a moment there where he thought it was going long, then decided it might be going short, and then kind of got stuck in the middle. Enzo directing seven, that ball straight at the body of his opponent. Rossier still two points in the lead. serves here for Brossier. Needs at least one of these two. And we'll get that one to go up 8-5. Eight, 8-5. Five. Eight, five. You know, both teams have still one timeout left here before the Golden Game. Tremendous point. Six eight. Rossier had some lunges to get balls back. I didn't think he had a chance for painting the line on one side, keeping the pressure on Angles. But Enzo, that's just a, a tough shot to to handle. Rossier down on a knee. Eight, seven. Seven, eight. Evan, I know you do a lot of commentary for different sports, so if you look at the cha uh, the championship weekend Time format, out. what are your thoughts on this uh, point cap change? Are there any other ways that you would approach it going from a point space system to a bracket? Yeah, you know, I can see both sides of the argument as we get a yeah. timeout here. Let's listen in. Yeah, it was a great receipt. Uh, also, I think if you can, if you can, if this is good, if you can play this one straight, th then you get this. He don't, he won't play, and then you can, then you can come back more active. 
Then yes. you can come more, a little bit more active. Be, be, be careful of a long, long serve to your back and now. He might try that. I know he can do it. He doesn't think I guess like even if he doesn't do it, he will yield. I mean, once we get there, anything can happen. Rossier trying to make up some of that ground for his team. Right now, 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 you know, we've discussed throughout the year that if I could snap my fingers and change rules of MLTT, uh, th there are several things I would like to change. Um, Seven, one eight. of them is, I think, if a player wins the first two games of a singles match, Let the match should be over and they get the three points. Right, so, so just imagine the, the leverage of these points here and there's two points on the line for both players in this moment at 8-7 in game two. Uh, if Rossier wins, he gets to play game three. If Rossier doesn't win, his day is done until the Golden Game. So that, that's one of the things I'd like to see change. Uh, another change that I would like to see is I don't think there should be a limit of lead you can have going into the Golden Game. I think if you're up 11-4 going into the Golden Game, you should have a seven-point lead at the start of the Golden Game. And I think I'd feel better about the championship weekend change if that was the case all Nine, along. Now, eight. with that said, we have not seen a team win a golden game but lose an overall match, which is to say that any time a team has gotten at least 11 points in regulation before the golden Whoa. game, we have seen that team eight, take four, care of business seven. in the golden game, yeah. even though sometimes it gets a little hairy. So, look, will the pressure be different if the team is up 7-0 or 9-0 and they've been dominant? And, you know, the other team gets a little momentum. Will that change the, the vibe? I don't know if we're just delaying the inevitable in that regard. So part of me thinks that we should maintain the format we've had all season long, but I certainly understand it. And uh, there are a handful of changes that Nine. we should make. Seven. Right now, we should probably focus on this big point at 10-9 between Anglais and Brossier. For the record, I also think we should go to due scoring, which I know is not necessarily a popular opinion. Ten. I understand the, the, the gravitas of this point at 10-10, but I, I, love, I love the golden point. You know, the point at 11-10 would be riveting too. The point at 15-14, if we got that far, would be fascinating. You know, it wouldn't happen very often, but you could get to 22-21. Like, why not? Anyway, this is the golden point right now. And Anglais missed it, so Brossier evens up the singles match in a game of beats. And that single point does keep Florida alive for sure going into the golden game. Big, big, big win for Benjamin Rossier there. One more game to 11 before we go to a golden game for the final time in the regular season between Carolina and Florida. Ladies and gentlemen, I speak 
Yes, until the goal game, yes, all together. After goal game, they rested. Before goal game, rested. Well, a little controversy here. The score is one nothing because Carolina's received so Roman gets a second yellow, yellow card, card which game. is a red, which is a free point for Benjamin Let's Rossier. Let's play, 0-1. Matt, can you uh, help us understand what just transpired? Um, I mean, one, the part one. that I understand is that the the cards uh, for the team match as a whole, not for the individual match. So the yellow card that I don't Matilda. know who received. No, 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 Matilda was the Crocs. Oh, so you're right. Roman. So, uh, yeah, the yellow card that Roman got first is still kind of in play. Uh, Two, I'm not one. entirely sure what Enzo was yellow carded for. I didn't see what happened right at the end of the, uh, the last match, I'm sure. I mean, it could have Some been some frustration at losing the. Could have been frustration. Could it have been coming back late to the table? It's possible. Three, yeah. one. Um, but yeah, that's, that's cost him the first point of the third game. And All right, let's go to our sideline reporter, Sean O'Neill. Oh, Sean's not here. <laughs> Sean, come on, man. One, four. So down 1-4, doesn't seem too thrilled with the situation here. Brossier is looking mentally solid right now. Carolina does have a timeout to use. Maybe it'll be used if he loses this point. This is interesting. Four, Enzo two. moving across the serve position because we spoke about it in his post-match interview after playing Jishan. Now I asked him, you know, do you move the service position to try and capture different angles? And he said no. It's just to do something different so that he can reset his, I guess, reset his mind. So interesting to see him do that now. Definitely a time when he would need to kind Four, of three. reset and get things going again. Five, Rossier three. leads at the half. Three and the players switch ends. Is there any uh, more draconian penalty Three, five. for uh, another yellow card or another red card? Or would it just be one point or would it be more severe? Four, uh, I think five. it's just one point. I think they can kind of. I mean, some people call it a red card warning, but it's not in the sense of the next penalty is a red card. It's not like a three-strike rule. Right. Um, they can award as many of those additional yellow cards as they want. I mean, especially in a situation like this where, you know, it's kind of unfortunate for Enzo to have another player's yellow card impacting his score. Part of the team game. Yep. Right now he's leveled things back up at 5-5. Five, five. Six, five. So take a look back here at the end of that game. A pretty, pretty small racket toss, I think. That's that racket toss got him the point penalty. Six, six. We see it one more time. There's definitely a there's a lot of a lot of subjectivity that goes into umpiring and interpreting the rules. I mean, yes, it's a racket toss, but I mean, could could that paddle toss damage the table? No, not really. Then, oh. what, then what's it's the just, problem? Just uh, how the rules are interpreted. And Wow, Brossier oh, catches a break. Six, seven. Uh, are the stars and planets and uh, celestial vibe 
all aligning right now for Brossier to take two out of three from his French countrymen. Should be a pretty big upset. Brossier Eight, hiding six. less topspin on that ball than Enzo was looking for, and pace as well. Ball dip low. Enzo not able to block, and Brossier, two points in the lead. He looks up. Maybe a high toss serve coming in. Depends where the lighting is. There it is. Dangerously close to the edge. I'm sure Enzo was nervous Eight, for a seven. second there. What a battle. Rossier certainly making Enzo work for these points. See Enzo knowing that Rossier can counter loop really well on the forehand is just plowing the ball into that backhand side. with some style points there on that down the line shot. The no look, throws in a little 360 to recover. Ties things up again. He's gonna have to be on his best behavior. Make sure he doesn't lose any more penalty points at this stage of the game. Enzo recovers the net ball. Nine, eight. And then the players get straight back into the offensive. in on the half long nine, with the forehand. Nine. Nine, nine. This match could go either way. It's been a great display from Brossier. The rallies have only gotten longer, more intense. What can Brossier do here with two serves nine, behind him? Nine. Sets up game point. That ball Eleven, nine, almost crawled two, over and then it fell up. backwards. Yeah. And Anglais overcomes the point penalty and Benjamin Brossier's tenacity to take two out of three in the final singles match before the Golden Game. The number one player in the league. Enzo Anglais survives and sets up Carolina with a five point lead heading into the Golden Game. That's coming up next. Recap here of the matches that started us off here. Daniel Gorak taking two out of three over Romain Laurence. That's where that first yellow card was earned for the Carolina Gold Rush. Jeremy Hazin in the tightest of margins overcoming Daniel Gonzalez. The doubles saw the mixed pairing prevail over the men. 
pretty dominant style there in the third 11-2. Saw a mixed singles between Matilda Ekholm and Kai Jung. A couple of pretty awesome rallies from Ekholm, but ultimately Kai Jung with the sweep. And of course, as you just saw, a rally-packed and explosive match between the two Frenchmen, Benjamin Brossier and Enzo Anglais. Enzo, 11-9, third game, just comes out on top. Get into a golden game pretty shortly. We are set for the Golden Game. Let's figure out what the order is going to be and bring in Assistant Commissioner Mimi Bosica. Mimi Bosica! Thank you, Ryan. Okay, coaches, so we currently have the Florida Crocs trailing the Carolina Gold Rush by five points, which means Carolina will begin with a 5-0 lead with the serve and the first pick is Florida. Mark Duran. Mark Duran will play first. Uh, Romain. We'll have Roman Lorenz play second, who will play second on your team. Enzo. Enzo Angles, who will play second. Benjamin Brossier. Benjamin Brossier, who will go next? Daniel Gorak. Daniel Gorak will go third. Kai Zhang. Kai Zhang will go third for Carolina. Four. Uh, we have Jeremy or Holland. Who, who they have? Holland. No, no, no. Who they have? They have Matilda and Daniel Gonzalez. Daniel Gonzalez. Jeremy. Jeremy Hazin will go fourth, which means Holland will go fifth. Who will play? Jeremy? Matilda. Matilda will play fourth, and fifth we will have Daniel Gonzalez. All right, coaches, good luck. Thank you so much, Mimi. Mimi Bosica stepping in to orchestrate the Golden Game order because the Kamish Flint Lane, who's traditionally in that role, is not going to be at the event in Wichita in a few weeks. And Mimi I think gets an A+. Plus yeah. Handling uh, this for the first time. All right, what do you think of the order, and what do you expect here in the Golden Game? 5-0 lead for Carolina at the start. Some big changes uh, in there, obviously. Five, With the matchup one. shifting, I think Jeremy and Matilda is going to be a really interesting matchup. I'm sure Jeremy will be feeling a little bit of pressure there. Hong and Gonzalez, another great mixed matchup. We've, we've seen the Golden Game order change to have more mixed matchups in the second half of this season than in the first. I think it was a trend that was kind of trailblazed a bit by Eric Owens when he put Dan Liu in the lineup against Hong Lin. It was uh, one of the big changes made by the Chicago win to try and conquer the nightmares that they were having with the Golden Game. Lawrence takes two out of three from Duran. A reminder of the odds being very much against Florida. Teams with a 5-0 lead to start the Golden Game this year are 33-2. And, and we very nearly, oh, that caught the edge and Brossier has had uh, some good fortune at times against Enzo. Enzo just walking over to the bench and shrugging. Florida was one point away from overcoming a five-point deficit against Princeton yesterday. Seven, three. Seven, three. 
Brassier is flustered on Glaze a little bit here. Yeah, he's done a really good job of driving the ball out wide to Enzo's forehand. Enzo had to cover a lot of space here on the table. That's the serve. Ai Jan coming in to face off with Daniel Gorak. There's a little something extra here, a little extra mojo for Florida. This is their final bowling game of the first season of Major League Table Tennis. Five, eight. Crocs 12 and nine in the golden game this season. Six, eight. All right, off to a good start here. Could potentially bring the Crocs within chomping distance. See what you did there. Kai a little bit too eager on that forehand opportunity. Set the ball up really well, but move the ball into the net. Gorak one away from a sweep here. And he gets denied it by Jung Kai. Big backhand attack. Nine-seven. Jeremy against Ekholm. I mean, Jeremy, he doesn't really have the power to hit through Matilda, but he has good control to move her around. Two lefties against each other. Serve return against Ekholm is going to be really important. Service error. Except in this, uh, <laughs> except in this case. Oh. He's not going to be happy about that miss. Oh. Right under his paddle. Wow, we don't see Jeremy Hazeen that far from the table very often. Fought his way back. They counter on the forehand. Both players kind of flailing on the backhand to get the ball back on. And Ekholm delivers for the Florida Crocs. Yeah, it's a split. She's been a solid performer against the male players in the Golden Games. Go home then for Daniel Gonzalez. <laughs> home Lynn has been one of the best players, not just females, but one of the best players overall in the Golden Games all season Eleven, long. Gonzalez nine. has been one of the weaker players. We'll see if that follows through today. to the Golden Game, Hong Lin. has got some, uh, some records to set clear. Wants to come out here strong today. She was in the tough spot yesterday, that 20-all ultimate golden point. Played aggressive, sent a ball long. Angela Guan prevailed. Tough one to swallow, though. Just sweep through. Come back two straight to Lynn. On Daniel's serve. Two serves for home. Oh, Gonzalez with a big attack off the serve. Thirteen ten. Let's play. Unless we get to 20 all, that's the final point of the season for Daniel Gonzalez. And he wins the final two points on Holmland's serve to salvage his split. 
now it's Lawrence and Duran. Final four points of Mark Duran's MLTT season right here. Mons now won three of the first four against Duran, including the first three points to start this golden game out. Clips the net, but sends a forehand down the line. Carolina Gold Rush getting a little bit of room to breathe here. Florida's going to need Brossier to step up again against Enzo. I think Hong definitely redeemed herself by taking pressure off the team here today. Roman Lorenz locked in here in the Golden Game. One point away from a Golden Sweep. Salvages the last point. The four point game. Anglais and Rossier return to the table. She got some clarification on the uh, yellow card situation from Sean O'Neill, which is funny because you were asking for him on the sideline. The second offensive is docked one point, the third offensive is two penalty points, and the fourth is sent to the referee. Thank you, Sean, for scrolling through the ITTF handbook for us. <laughs> oh, just missed the back edge of the table. Anglais with two serves and a four-point lead. See two comebacks from teams trailing to start the Golden Game this weekend. It's been a rarity not just this season, but particularly the second half of the season. Oh, Enzo so on the I mean, Enzo's had some golden games that he's wanted back, but this is a strong sequence here. He's one point away from golden sweep that oh. more than likely send Carolina to the finish line. Great stuff oh, from Brossier. Brossier. What a point. That's the final point he'll play in the first season of Major League Table Tennis, Matt. It's a nice one to end on. See what Gorak can do against Kai Jong. He played well against him last time. Back to a three-point game. A golden sweep would tie it up. At Coleman Hazim would face the next four pressure pack points. We're going to get a timeout first. <laughs> Gorak kind of. <laughs> I think uh, Kai's feeling the pressure knowing that 15, Florida 18. Crocs are on 15 points and closing the gap a little. Certainly more conviction in those swings from Kai John. What, what did Gorak do before, at that timeout that you were about to comment on? I think he was kind of, he was ready to serve, so the timeout was right as he was about to time serve. Out, <laughs> now we're going to get a Florida timeout. <laughs> I, look at, I love that little nod of the head from Frank Aris. He's like, yeah, I have one too. Uh, I send a kicker. Okay. Where are my Florida Crocs? Just, uh, 
you know, if it's a, if you don't see it, probably it's a, so I think uh, go for it. In, in any case, go for it. In any case, go for it. Come on, let's go. Well, it's the final match of the regular season for Florida and Carolina. I think that's the first time all year we've had timeouts called one point apart from one another. That was, uh, was certainly a little entertainment factor in that. 19 serving, 15, John two points away. And that serve is ace. Gets Carolina to match point. 5-0 lead certainly looms large, doesn't it? <laughs> Carolina closes out the regular season with a 16-5 victory over the Florida Crocs as Kai Jong finishes the Golden Game 21-15. Carolina on to the playoffs and championship weekend. The Florida Crocs, a valiant competitor. They started the season by winning five of their first six Golden Games. But uh, the Princeton Revolution came off strong. Carolina victorious today. We'll chat with the winners next. Carolina prevails over Florida by a final score of 16 to five. The Gold Rush win the Golden Game 21-15, and we're joined by Gold Rush coach Alex Yang. Congratulations, Alex! You finish the regular season 16 and six overall, also 16 and six in Golden Games. How important was this match for you today after not winning the first two days of this weekend? Uh, this game match is very important to win and uh, build the confidence back because we lost uh, three match in the row, uh, including the last week, uh, last match, last month. I mean, so I told them also the player says we have to win and uh, give all, everybody confidence, then go to the f finals. And uh, I know you changed the golden game order up a lot. Um, if you look at Hong's performance, I mean, obviously last night she was in a really tough spot uh, after the Golden Game, um, had the chance to close it out for the team but wasn't able to. Um, how happy were you uh, with her performance today in the doubles against two male players and then again against Gonzalez? 
in the Golden Game? Uh, home plays so very well today for the doubles and the Golden Game. You know, sometimes it's happened, you know. It's, uh, so after, I think she tell me she has confidence. So, mm. How are you feeling about your team heading into the playoffs, Alex? Uh, it's not easy, but we will try. Any uh, Anything that you'll be working on between now and then? Yes, yes. Uh, some players will go back to France, to the French National Championship the next week. Then Kai is going to Olympic Trial USA next mm. week. And Jeremy is going to Canada Olympic Trials, so the following week. So that means they always play match, so keep good form, I think. All right. Well, congrats on a phenomenal regular season, best in the East. And uh, we'll see you in six weeks in Chicago with a championship on the line. Thanks, Alex. Okay, thank you. Alex Yang, the head coach of the Carolina Gold Rush. Uh, that they were not number one from start to finish because Florida actually got the better of Carolina early yeah. in the season, but the Gold Rush finished the season four and two against the Crocs, and uh, they had winning records against everybody in this division. And uh, that was, uh, I mean, they were they were four and two against everybody in the division. They were four and a goal against the West, and. Uh, I mean, Matt, are they the favorite heading into the championship weekend? Uh, I don't know if I'd say they're the favorite. I mean, Princeton are running red hot. Bay Area have stepped up. There's there's so much that could happen. We don't know who's coming in from the West yet. So, uh, as Alex Yang said, pretty, it's going to be tough. Fun watching the Florida Crocs. Players like Benjamin Rossier battling with everything they've got. Look forward to seeing what the Crocs have in year two. Still got one more match to go this weekend. Princeton and Chicago to cap our Sunday in New Jersey. That's coming up in about 22 minutes. For Matt Hetherington and our entire crew, I'm Evan Leffler saying so long for now. Kai Jong closes out the Golden Game, and Carolina finishes their season on a victorious note. Princeton, Chicago at the top of the hour to cap the weekend here in Lawrenceville.